Welcome, friends. You're watching Weekends with Anna Kasparian. Nando Vila is out, but that's okay because we have the wonderful Paul Prescott joining us today. Paul, how are you? Good. How are you doing? I was doing uh, good. just saying before, I look enough like Nando, maybe no one would notice, you know, would have been an interesting <laughs> experiment to see if people noticed. Um, well, I mean, I... I, I highly doubt that, uh, but you know, this is the first time you and I are doing a show together and I'm really looking forward to it um, because I learn something new on the show every day from Nando's, mm -hmm. um, you know, decodes. And you, as I work with people more and more, you just kind of get to know them and what right. motivates them, what they're passionate about. And, um, you know, I did a, like I skimmed through your decode today and it's going to be fantastic. And I think it's um, very much in line with uh, this theme that we have going on with the interview today as well with Eric Foner. Um, he's the author of uh, Reconstruction. He's also a, um, the Emeritus Professor of History at Columbia and a leading expert on Reconstruction. So it's going to be a great conversation today. Um, and we're going to have some fun. Uh, yeah especially at the top where we're going to address one of your comments that I'm really excited about. So, uh, Kale, if you don't mind, can you bring up that super chat? Uh, because it has to do with the story we covered last week. Um, and this is a fantastic update. I'm really happy about it. Uh, so Derek writes in and says, just wanted to let you know, Baltimore's new mayor, Brandon Scott, canceled the spy plane and took all our data back. Thanks for doing the story, Anna. I'm really happy to hear that. Um, it was just indiscriminate surveillance of uh, the people of Baltimore. And this is a program that's being tested out in other cities as well. Um, so this is incredibly positive news. I'm really happy about it. Yeah. And it's good. You know, we can be useful once in a while by getting these stories out there, you know. Definitely. Yeah. Well, um, a story that might not be useful, but it's certainly entertaining. So, um, you know, Paul, you mentioned this for our uh, banter. And I think it's right. perfect because... Uh, Look, well, Donald Trump, not so great. Not not a great guy, uh, but certainly entertaining. So, uh, Paul, do you want to give the audience the details? Yeah. And, you know, I should say it is kind of a sad story. Um, union density is low in this country, and um, it just got a little lower. Uh, so Donald Trump has left the Screen Actors Guild, I'm sad to say. We have one less union member in our ranks. Um, Screen Actors Guild was uh, thinking of doing disciplinary action against Donald Trump um, and Trump, of course, you know, he doesn't want to be one off. He preemptively resigned um, and wrote probably one of the most hilarious letters I've ever uh, seen. I hope it's in the archives forever. Um, it kind of made me think, you know, I'm going to miss this under Biden. Um, I think, Kale, you have the uh, letter up there. I mean, just to read some of this. Um, <laughs> I love I love the opening sentence. I write to you today regarding the so-called disciplinary committee hearing aimed at revoking my union membership. Who cares? Well, I'm not familiar <laughs> with your work. I'm very proud of my work on movies such as Home Alone 2, Zoolander, and Wall Street, Money Never Sleeps, and television shows including <laughs> The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Saturday Night Live, and of course, one of the most successful shows in television history, The Apprentice, to name just a few. And he, you know, he goes on, he says, <laughs> MSDNC, fake news CNN, at the end, he says, you know, uh, all you do is collect dues and promote un-American policies and ideas, and you have done nothing for me. Um, it was just beautiful. And I love that line about, I'm not familiar with your work. Um, I'm not sure what you do it's, as a union, but I know about my work and what I've done. It's such classic Trump. Like, right. this, is, this is how he responds to any type of criticism, any type of disciplinary action. Um, he, he just refuses to ever be held accountable for anything or have a moment of real self-reflection. But honestly, um, his communication style is unmatched. Uh, no president in this nation's history writes official letters the way a 13-year-old high school girl would, you know, right. like just drama, like who cares? Like every time I read him, like there's two ways to read his stuff. It's either to read it in that pretty good, you know, um, uh, yeah. it's been getting yeah, rusty yeah. since he left, but, uh, been working on it. <laughs> yeah. Like that breathy, like voice. Um, and then the other way that I personally read it is as if it's written by a Valley girl, uh, mm, because right. it's just, if you had never heard his voice before. It's just the way his writing comes across. And it's just like, who cares? Right. Care? And as a high school teacher. I'm not familiar teacher, with your work. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
And no offense to high school students, but as a high school teacher, I can attest to um, the style is uh, maybe more so middle school. It mimics that that style. Um, but yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, we're not going to get those gems on the Biden, unfortunately. But um, I'm sure he'll he'll come Sad. out with many more similar letters, right? Um, but yeah, we have one less union member. Um, so I don't know. Maybe in the end, the union busters are winning. Yeah, although I mean, this member, I, I don't know how I feel about him getting booted or or leaving uh, the union. Um, I, I mean, some of the disciplinary action is is fascinating. So I don't know, maybe later we yeah. can have like a more robust discussion about it. But um, I'm joking, I don't care that he's leaving, yeah. by the way. Just so yeah, we're cool. <laughs> he's, he's such a joke. He's a joke, but at the same time, it's like this, sometimes this overreaction um, to Trump that only emboldens him more that I think is interesting. But anyway, um, why don't we do our verso read and then we'll get to our decodes. Yeah, so I don't know about you, Anna, but I've just about read all the books I have. I'm cooped up at home. So I think it's probably time for many people to get new, book, new books. Um, so if you join the Verso Book Club and get every new ebook that Versus, Verso publishes each month, as, as well as one to four books in the mail. Um, and all Verso Book Club members will also get 50% off all books for as long as you are a subscriber. And as a special introductory offer, each member tier is 50% off for your first three months. So the reader tier is only $5 uh, a month for ebooks only. The comrade tier is $20 a month. And if you join in February, you'll get um, a few selections. One of them is Breaking Things at Work. The Luddites are right about why you hate your job by Gavin Mueller. If you want to learn about how to break stuff at work. Um, Tomorrow They Don't Dare to Murder Us, a novel by Joseph Andras and translated from French by Simon, uh, Simon Lazare. The Rise and Decline of Patriarchal Systems and Intersectional Political Economy by uh, Nancy Fulber, and Inequality and the Labyrinth of Democracy by Gordon Thurban. Um, so those are selections available at, at Verso. Please join our book club and get some new books for uh, this long and drawn out COVID. Absolutely. All right, well, um, let's get to our decode segment and uh, you know, one thing that I've been thinking about a lot uh, since the riots occurred in the Capitol was what are some solutions? What What's the accurate response uh, to make our system better without increasing surveillance and the security state? Um, and one of the things that we do need to focus on is our media and really how broken it is. And uh, there was a fantastic piece in Jacobin this week uh, by uh, Branko uh, Marcetich, uh, Marcetich. And um, he talks about uh, where people get their news uh, and, and how we've been focusing on the wrong medium. We've been focusing on social media far too much when you consider where the majority of uh, Americans consume their news. And there is a problem with this for-profit media model. So let's, let's get into it. Let's talk about that. One of the more amusing interactions in news this week revolved around a Trump-loving pillow entrepreneur named Mike Lindell. The My Pillow guy, uh, you know, has been regurgitating unfounded claims of widespread voter fraud, and it's gotten himself and people like him in quite a bit of trouble as a Smartmatic and Dominion, uh, two companies who, uh, you know, create and manufacture um, voting machines and uh, voting software are suing because of defamation. These are lies. Uh, the defamatory remarks made by uh, Mike Lindell has uh, caused damages to these companies. And so as a result of these defamation lawsuits they filed, uh, the media is kind of scrambling with uh, the question of what to do. Do we still have this uh, attention-seeking, ratings-boosting uh, Mike Lindell on? And if we do, it might lead to a legal liability here considering these defamation lawsuits. So with all that context in mind, take a quick look at this wonderful moment on Newsmax when they brought Mike Lindell, the MyPillow guy, on to discuss PC culture and right-wingers getting censored, but Lindell wanted to talk about something else. Watch. So you know what? They did this because I'm revealing all the evidence on Friday of all the election fraud with these machines. So I'm sorry if you think okay. it's not uh, Mike, it's real. I, I, can I ask our producers, can we uh, get out of here, please? 
Uh, I, I don't want to have to keep going over this. Actually, we at Newsmax Mike, have not been able wait, to verify wait, any of those wait, allegations. Wait, that you're, you're, Mike, oh, hold on a second. Business. Everybody hold on a second. Mike, Mike, hold on one second. Uh, let's talk a little bit about just what is happening overall in terms of censorship. That was fantastic. And the truth of the matter is, uh, if it weren't for the pending lawsuits uh, claiming defamation, uh, Mike Lindell would be able to continue spreading his lies about widespread voter fraud. He would spread misinformation uh, to the American people, which, of course, has led to uh, quite a bit of division, uh, especially when it comes to the outcome of the general election. Um, and honestly, when it comes to defamation lawsuits, consider the fact that many people shy away from them because the burden of proof in these lawsuits is so high. You have to prove something known as actual malice in indicating that there's evidence that the individuals who are being um, accused of defamation intentionally engaged in this behavior. They maliciously engaged in this behavior. And you also have to prove damages. And so it, you can understand in this for-profit deregulated media industry where, again, profit comes before everything else, including informing the people, uh, misinformation spreads, sensationalism spreads, and it's not done in the public's interest. It's done to make these private corporations incredibly wealthy uh, by driving up ratings and bringing in more revenue through ad, ad dollars. Now, um, when we think about the spread of misinformation in America, a lot of that focus has been on social media, right? The spread of fake news on Facebook and Twitter. And to be sure, that is an issue. But it's not as influential as the misinformation people get from television news. And to be sure, television news and radio, um, because of the nature of public airwaves, uh, had to be licensed if you wanted to do a show, a news program. And that licensing came along with certain regulations. Those regulations were repealed in the 1980s under the Reagan administration. And that's what led to the disastrous media landscape that we're experiencing today. So let's talk a little bit about where people get their news. And uh, I would definitely uh, recommend that everyone check out a recent piece by Branko Marsatic uh, in Jacobin, where he says, mm, turns out that most people watch television news and trust television news. As of 2019, for instance, 53% of Americans got their political news primarily through local network and cable television compared to the 18% who did so through social media. And people who consume the news this way do so because they actually trust the television news shows that they're consuming. Um, so for instance, in 2019, a Pew study found Upward of 65% of Democrats, liberals, Republicans, and conservatives trusted, and this is pretty dire, CNN and Fox News, depending on their ideolo ideology and partisan leaning. And when you think about how disastrous it is that people are getting their um, you know, news from cable uh, and they're trusting it from cable, I mean, how do you compare that to social media when all of the discussion that we're hearing in America right now seems to center on social media where independent news organizations tend to thrive? People's distrust in social media has actually increased. Uh, the most recent Pew research found that 59% of social media news consumers expect the news they see on platforms to be largely inaccurate, a rise of two points from 2018. So less people are getting their news from social media. People don't really trust the news they get from social media. And at the same time, while all of the focus uh, on our discourse is on social media, most Americans, again, are getting their news from television, which has been deregulated and has a for-profit model, which does not end up serving the best interests of the public. Um, so the data reveals that the for-profit television news uh, model is the core of the toxic spread of misinformation that we're experiencing today. According to the Berkman Klein Center study uh, published last year, based on 55,000 web stories, 5 million tweets, and 75,000 Facebook posts, social media played a secondary role in spreading disinformation about mail-in voter fraud, which uh, was instead an elite-driven mass media-led process most often Fox and talk radio. 
And obviously there are dire consequences to people relying on Fox and talk radio to get their news, especially when it comes to the election. Here's what that looked like. Some people at the protest told us the delays in news outlets projecting a winner contributed to their belief that Biden stole the election. America first, or else it's going to be America last. Stand together. You don't think there's any way Trump could have lost? No. Really? Yes. How do you go from almost losing 200,000 in five hours, you're down to 30,000 votes away from winning? A lot of Democrats voted in the mail, they voted absentee, they voted before uh, election day. And in a lot of states, those election day votes got counted first. That's why Trump had that early lead. And then once those other votes started getting counted, that is how Biden caught up and, and So overtook. where are all the Trump ballots that were mailed in? Well, uh, why are we finding them laying around in different places? But Trump was telling everybody not to mail it in, right? That's why there's so much more mail-in Democratic uh, votes, no? No. So that was uh, the outcome of all the misinformation uh, that was uh, spewed on Fox News, OAN, and Newsmax. Uh, the latter two are, of course, uh, even further to the right in their messaging than even Fox News is. And again, there were consequences to that. 70% of Republicans now say they don't believe the 2020 election was fair and free, a stark rise from the 35% of GOP voters who held similar beliefs before the election, uh, meaning that there was disinformation even after the election took place, which increased the number of Republican voters believing that the election was stolen from Donald Trump. Among those who believed that the election wasn't free and fair, 78% believed that mail-in voting led to widespread voter fraud and 72% believed that ballots were tampered with. And so, gee, I wonder why they thought that. It's important to stand up to this voter fraud and encourage all of our elected officials to stand up and say enough is enough and fight for all Americans so that none of us are disenfranchised. There's nothing partisan judges would like to destroy more in the end than a quick, efficient, fraud-free election night. That's the goal here, make no mistake. Well, there's a big discussion right now about mail-in voting. Hillary yeah. Clinton said it's fine, it's, it's fair. Well, it absolutely opens the floodgates to fraud. The, those things are delivered into mailboxes. They can be taken out. There's questions about whether or not it even denies a secret ballot because a lot of the states have you signing the outside of the envelope. Trump won the election. He'll win the recount. He'll win in court. Right now, Joe Biden is pretending to be the president-elect. So... Following all of those news reports, uh, of course, it, it just led to more division. It led to what we saw in the Capitol a few weeks ago uh, with these uh, rioters breaching the Capitol building and wreaking havoc. Um, and some might think, well, this is just our system. This is just what our media is all about. There's nothing we can do about it. But the fact of the matter is we used to have standards for the public airways, uh, airwaves, in order for someone to uh, receive a broadcast license, in order for a news organization to qualify for a broadcast license, they had to undergo FCC regulations uh, that required them to serve the public interest, to cover topics that matter to the public, uh, to ensure that they cover those topics fairly by providing uh, the arguments made on all sides, to also provide an opportunity for someone who might have disagreed with a newscast to uh, make an appearance on the same newscast to make their case. And those regulations um, fell under something known as the Fairness Doctrine. From the 1940s through the 1980s, um, there was this FCC regulation that called uh, for the uh, mandated that mandated for broadcasts to again devote reasonable amount of time to issues that matter to people, and then the second part was about um, fair coverage that provides opportunities for different points of view. Now, uh, the stations who uh, abided by this regulation had wide latitude uh, to do this or to fulfill this need. Um, by let's say having uh, uh, someone coming on to share their opinion. There was no regulation indicating that they needed to get, be given 
equal time on a newscast. So again, there were different ways that uh, news organizations could fulfill um, the requirements of this regulation. But the way that the right wing, uh, you know, really framed this was nothing more than a violation of free speech. Now, we'll explore that in just a second. But I do want to talk about some of the provisions, some of the important details uh, that the FCC regulations under the Fairness Doctrine entailed, like the right to respond, and I'll give you some specific cases. For instance, in 1967, the FCC announced new rules governing the right to respond and held that when a a personal attack against an individual's or a group's honesty, character, integrity, or like personal qualities was waged, or when a broadcast license licensee um, offered a political editorial endorsing or opposing a qualified political candidate, the broadcast licensee was obliged to notify those in question of the date, time, and identification of the broadcast. The broadcast licensee uh, was also required to provide a transcript tape or accurate summary of the personal attack or editorial and to provide a reasonable opportunity to respond over the broadcast licensees um, facilities. And so there was a very specific case uh, that you should know about. Here's what it entailed. Take a look. The FCC created the doctrine 38 years ago. Its most famous challenge, the Red Lion case in 1964, involved a crusader. We will bring leadership back to this country for Christ and against communism. The minister attacked a liberal author, Fred Cook, in a radio broadcast. The station refused Cook's request to reply. The FCC and then the Supreme Court sided with Cook, citing the Fairness Doctrine. But today, the FCC cited the same Red Lion decision, saying the court opinion said the doctrine should be ended if it chills speech. But it didn't chill speech. As you guys can imagine, it did quite the opposite. It provided for more speech. And the argument that we hear over and over again is, especially from right-wingers these days, is that if you hear speech that you don't like, you don't combat it by censoring it, you uh, engage with more speech. But historically, the right wing in this country has not been in favor of more speech. Uh, historically, they've done everything and anything to squash opposing points of view in newscasts. And by the way, Mike Pence, who was a talk show radio host back in the day, obviously a right wing talk show radio host, was one of the um, you know biggest uh, proponents of repealing these FCC regulations. By the way, another example that is um, incredibly important to, to kind of look into is uh, the case involving a television station in Jackson, Mississippi. This was WLBT, which was the first ever television station to lose its license for its incredibly racist defense of segregation. So um, I'll give you details on what happened there. Individual activists uh, and the state chapter of the NAACP had pressured WLBT for years to allow black Mississippians uh, response time under the FCC's fairness doctrine, which required local stations to offer airtime for opposing views on controversial issues. But in the fall of 1955, Thurgood Marshall um, NAACP lawyer and, uh, of course, future uh, Supreme Court justice appeared on NBC News uh, on an NBC News program to discuss the implications of the court's 1954 and 1955 Brown v. Board of Education decisions, which declared segregated schools unconstitutional. Marshall had argued that the cases before the uh, had argued the cases before the court. WLBT, just to give you an example of how awful they were, interrupted the broadcast and instead uh, aired a slide that read, sorry, cable trouble from New York. So by the 1960s, uh, the civil rights movement, um, you know, really made the threat of uh, the fairness doctrine, the enforcement of the fairness doctrine, a reality for WLBT. So at that point, uh, media activist by the name of Everett Parker, along with the Office of Communication for the United Church of Christ, eventually succeeded in getting the FCC to revoke the television license for this um, for this station. Um, so this happened by 1971. And here's Everett Parker sharing um, his experience uh, fighting for this to happen. Judge Berger, uh, on the morning of the day that he he was sworn in as Chief Justice of the United States. 
he filed the opinion, the, the, the decision, and the decision was that the license was revoked. Hmm. And ultimately, uh, Medgar Evers, soon after, the great civil rights leader who was soon assassinated, went on the air on the station that had not heard black or broadcast black voices. Well so as you can imagine, uh, racists and right-wingers in this country absolutely hated the Fairness Doctrine uh, because, first of all, it focused uh, more attention on fairness in news coverage as opposed to profit. And uh, that was something that they wanted to chip away at. And unfortunately, uh, by the time Reagan was in office, uh, they were able to accomplish that. By 1987, um, the FCC under the Reagan administration essentially repealed the Fairness Doctrine. In Washington today, the Federal Communications Commission voted unanimously to abolish the so-called Fairness Doctrine. It requires broadcasters to give time for all sides of a controversial issue. It was not a universally popular decision by any means. And uh, it's worth mentioning that every FCC commissioner uh, who uh, engaged in that vote was uh, appointed by either Reagan or Nixon. So uh, they certainly had a bias against uh, this, this regulation, and they effectively were able to accomplish what conservatives in this country had wanted ever since the uh, Fairness Doctrine was implemented. Now, what followed was not only um, an emboldened right wing with, uh, you know, more and more right wing programming without uh, the opportunity for an opposing view to respond. The deregulation also paved the way for media monopolies, better known as media conglomerates. Um, media really started to consolidate, and that meant that only a few corporations, massive corporations, uh, got to decide what we hear and what we consume in our news content. This was something that uh, Ralph Nader, who was a consumer advocate at the time, was genuinely concerned about. What we're seeing here is the ultimate transfer of monopoly power to the broadcast industry who already have exclusive licenses to decide who says what on TV and now don't have to worry about fairness anymore. And he was right to be concerned uh, because his prediction uh, certainly turned out to be true. Uh, for instance, uh, in 1983, 50 corporations dominated most of every mass media. And the biggest media merger in history was a $340 million deal. In 1987, the 50 companies had shrunk to 29. Remember, 1987 is the year that the FCC had repealed the Fairness Doctrine. In 1990, the 29 had shrunk to 23. In 1997, the biggest firms numbered 10 and, uh, and involved the $19 billion Disney ABC deal, at the time the biggest media merger ever. In 2000, AOL, Time Warner's uh, $350 billion merger um, was more than 1,000 times larger than the biggest deal of 1983. And if you fast forward to today, and I know I'm taking a while to get to this, uh, we're basically consuming media. 90% of our media is owned by five major corporations, AT&T, Comcast, Disney, uh, Viacom, CBS, uh, which is one uh, media conglomerate. And then we have, of course, Fox. Uh, and what's also clear is that the whole purpose of the news business in America is just that. It's a business. It's no longer um, something that's meant to serve the public interest. It's no longer a place where uh, spreading information, ensuring that the public is informed so they can be active participants in this democratic process, that is not the, the priority. The priority is profit. It is a business-driven model, and that has significant ramifications. And by the way, uh, if you want to focus on how that's, um, you know, recently negatively impacted this country, think about the fact that, uh, uh, you know, ratings-driven profits um, might be the reason why uh, the CBS CEO uh, at the time, Les Moonves, was uh, very much in favor of giving Donald Trump um, a disproportionate amount of attention and news coverage in 2015. Uh, Lee Fong writes for The Intercept at the time, CBS chief, 
uh, says, go Trump, uh, go Donald Trump, keep getting out there. And he also just specifically mentioned that the flood of campaign dollars coming from the election um, made the whole experience of that election cycle phenomenal. And uh, when you're worried about profits, when that is the top priority, so-called news organizations, I mean, I'm being generous in calling them that, like Newsmax, um, end up having to tuck tail and they have to end up sucking to sucking up to the gravy train, even when they know it involves a legal liability, which is why the whole Newsmax Mike Lindell story ended like this. There was some confusion, and Mike thought that we were to talk about vote fraud in the recent election. It's a topic we have covered extensively on Newsmax. I was frustrated that we couldn't focus on the current very pressing issue of free speech and cancel culture. And in hindsight, there is no question that I could have handled the end of the interview differently. At Newsmax, we seek out all points of view. Mike was back on Newsmax last night with Rob Schmidt on his show to continue the conversation about cancel culture and the censorship by social media. Mike also made clear he thinks Newsmax is great, his words, and I can tell you he will continue to be an important guest on Newsmax. So sad, so pathetic. And uh, I guess that's what happens when you're chasing dollars, when you're chasing profits, uh, you have to put your own dignity aside. You have to put the best interests of the public aside, and you have to suck up to the very people who might actually get you personally sued uh, as a result of their spread of defamatory um, content. And so uh, Bernie Sanders is absolutely right in what the accurate media model should be in this country. Uh, we should have local, publicly controlled, democratically controlled media. Um, media that, again, is meant to serve the public's interest as opposed to uh, serve as a vehicle for profits. There shouldn't be a situation where our anchors bring in literally millions and millions of dollars, essentially disconnecting them from the realities that the majority of Americans are facing today. And so re-implementing uh, the fairness doctrine is certainly a good first step. I mean, this is something that people aren't even talking about right now, but it could be a good first step if we're genuinely concerned about rooting out the spread of misinformation and disinformation in this country. Um, but really focusing on the uh, solutions that have been put forth by Bernie Sanders, someone who seems to be right about pretty much every issue, um, makes more sense. And hopefully it's something that we can accomplish um, as a long-term goal. Yeah. And um, I'm really glad you brought this up because I think on the left, you know, when we talk about deregulation we, that happened in the late seventies, early eighties, a lot of times we talk about deregulation of trucking, of finance, of the airline industry, of labor law, but we, we don't really talk about the media as much. And I think it's good to hear that, you know, I think a lot of us feel kind of hopeless in this media landscape. Like, what, you know, what do we do about it? But I think, you know, there were solutions in the past that we can build on and we need to because Obviously, it's happening not just on the right. I mean, think about the left, uh, you know, liberal mainstream media during Bernie Sanders campaign, you know, and mm -hmm. it was interesting hearing about that law that, you know, if you attack someone's personal character, they have to uh, be able to respond. I mean, just imagine when they brought the body language expert out against Bernie, if he would have been able to respond to that, you know, that it would have been a whole different ballgame. Definitely. And, and, you know, the fairness doctrine, like at the core of the fairness doctrine, again, was this idea that the news is not meant to be profitable. Like the, the whole point right. of the news is to serve the public's interest. And so um, remember, whenever you hear arguments against this type of legislation, because it's uh, it's against the First Amendment, it stifles speech, it literally does the opposite. It creates more opportunities for robust discussions and debates that we desperately need in this country. And, you know, I remember when Fox News uh, used to try to present itself as fair and balanced when it wasn't fair and balanced at all. The reason why they would do that is because that's what the public wanted. And so it was a good marketing scheme for them, but they didn't actually carry out fair and balanced programming. We need to get back to a point where um, fair and balanced programming in the public's interest, as opposed to in the interest of making money, um, is how our system, our new system works. Uh, we don't have that. We're very right. far from that right now.
Yeah. yeah, and it has political effects. I mean, think back to the, the Bernie campaign. I think one of the biggest things I realized coming out of that is the mainstream media still has a huge effect on people politically. You know, so many people I know liked Bernie, but they were convinced that everyone else did not like Bernie, you know, and it was just relentless. Mm -hmm. At first, they don't cover him. And then, you know, the relentless attacks. So, you know, like like you show with the, the data there, people still do watch the mainstream media more than social media, and it, it does have effects um, on political outcomes. Definitely. All right. Well, um, Paul, this is your first decode on your first appearance uh, on weekend. So I'm super excited to hear what you've got. All right. Um, so, you know, in this moment of racial reckoning, Black Lives Matter protests and people trying to make sense of racial inequality in this country, something is rearing its ugly head again. And, you know, sometimes in conversations, my leftist ears will per perk up when I hear people say that, you know, reforms on race are meaningless without economic empowerment. But soon I realize what people mean by that. They're not talking about working people running the economy for their benefit. They're talking about black capitalism, more black business owners, more black owned businesses, more black people spending their money at black owned businesses. Black capitalism permeates our culture. Black people are constantly told by other wealthy black stars that if only we learn how to invest right, we can overcome the structural barriers of poverty. After all, if Nas figured it out, you can too. One thing that should have been really strong on our minds was business. This is America. This is capitalism at its finest. We're doing everything besides legal business. We're not caring too much about if America's saying stop complaining, get off your ass, black guys, and make something yourself, then it's like, for me, I'm like, okay, then let's, let's start teaching the little dudes on, and little women on the block business, money management, and entrepreneurship. Right. And we don't have any more time to waste. There's no more time to play around. We have to literally literally go back on the block with a plan, come down there and show them business modules and, and show them how they can get into computer programming, real estate, get into engineering, get into all the things that are making a lot of money, all the things that are making this country better. We can do it. It just needs to be cool. It needs to feel like it's something cool. It needs to feel like, all right, we tried this. Watch the movie Scarface. You know how that's going to end, right? So that's all we need to do. We just need to make it cool. If we make business cool, all black youth can be computer programmers and real estate developers. We're told that these deep inequalities don't need public policy to address. We can just use consumerism, especially since the summer protests, black and white liberals are increasingly focusing on buying black. Following a summer full of national headlines around George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Black Lives Matter and the coronavirus, a new movement emerged called Buy Black, highlighting black owned businesses and giving them much needed support. According to the latest statistics from the U.S. Census Bureau's annual business survey, minorities own an estimated one million businesses in the U.S. Of those, just 12 percent were black owned. And according to Yelp, mentions of black owned in reviews are up 617 percent this summer compared to last. Consumers are eager to seek out, find and support black owned businesses. Tara Lewis is a Yelp trends expert. In fact, just this past summer, in Yelp, we noticed a 6,520 percent increase in searches for black owned businesses. Looking at those numbers, I mean, what does that tell you? It tells you that people are really interested in putting their dollars where their values are and what they care about the most. If they have a choice to spend uh, at multiple different places, and right now that they really want to support the Black community, supporting Black-owned businesses with your dollars is a great way to do that. So in the 1950s, we were told that what's good for General Motors is good for America. And Black capitalism tells us that what is good for one Black business owner is good for all Black people. Somehow, the majority of Black working class people benefit when some Black individuals and their companies get rich. If you can't tell from the tone of my voice, I think this is fatally flawed idea. But this is not a new idea. Booker T. Washington in the late 19th century told black people to stop pressing for political solutions and align your interests with the business elite. Marcus Garvey galvanized millions of black people around the idea that the establishment of black businesses would lead to black independence and glory. Some of the most successful black businesses were owned by the Nation of Islam and Malcolm X also extolled the virtues of black capitalism. So our people not only have to be uh, re-educated to the importance of supporting black business, but the black man himself has to be uh, made aware of the importance of going into business. 
And once you and I go into business, we own and operate at least the businesses in our community, what we will be doing is developing a situation wherein we will actually be able to create employment for the people in the community. And once you can create some, pl I mean, some employment in the community where you live, it will eliminate the necessity of you and me having to act ignorantly and disgracefully boycotting and picketing some cracker someplace else trying to beg him for a job. Anytime you have to rely upon your enemy for a job, you're in bad shape. Later in the 20th century, it was actually Richard Nixon, believe it or not, that revived the legitimacy of black capitalism. In 1968, take a look at this advertisement he placed in the black cultural magazine, Jet Magazine. He wrote, a vote for Richard Nixon for president is a vote for a man who wants Homer to have the chance to own his own business. Richard Nixon believed strongly in black capitalism because black capitalism is black power in the best sense of the word. It's the key to the black man's fight for equality for a piece of the action. And it was under Nixon that the Small Business Administration first started targeting black entrepreneurs for federal assistance. You may be laughing, but this cynical maneuver brought Nixon some unlikely support from pr prominent black figures. People like James Brown, the NFL star and supposed militant Jim Brown, and Sammy Davis Jr. all endorsed Nixon in 1972. In fact, at an event during his re-election campaign, Malcolm X's widow, Betty Shabazz, was, an was in attendance of all people. But there was another Nixon supporter who attempted one of the biggest experiments in black capitalism, and that was Floyd McKissick. McKissick was a leader of CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, which coordinated some of the most iconic civil disobedience actions of the civil rights movement, like the Freedom Rides. Ms. McKissick let left CORE in the late 1960s, and he started McKissick Enterprises and pursued the building of Soul City. Soul City was supposed to be a town built by black wealth and for black people. Black people want to have the choice to live where they want to. If a Negro leader today announced plans for creation of a black built, black owned town to be called Soul City in North Carolina. In this new town, persons will be able to control their own destinies. Seeing this whole thing being transformed was the most liberating thing I've ever experienced in my lifetime. Affordable housing, people were going to get jobs, that's what made sense back then. We thought we had a very good plan in place, and the question then was how we could execute any of it. Even as President Nixon on down, we were trying to make a case that they were very supportive. On the ground, we didn't have the dollars. Soul City failed because even this capitalist project needed massive investments from the federal government to succeed, and that investment wasn't there. Ironically, in order to make this symbol of black independence work, McKinnick had to beg Nixon and other powerful white men for the money to make it possible. But even if the investment was there, it would fail to improve the lives of a substantial number of black working people. Why should we assume that the prof profits of McKissick would trickle down to other black people? Trump has used the same Nixon playbook when he, assigned, when he signed an executive order to establish opportunity zones or low tax areas to incentivize investment in communities that have been abandoned for decades. Let's hear what Ben Carson had to say about these opportunity zones. Mr. Secretary, let's get right at it. If I'm a private sector investor, I've got private money and I'm going into these, one of these opportunity zones, what do I get? What do you do for me? Well, you know, this is the wonderful thing. In the past, there you got nothing. And that's why these areas have been neglected economically. But now you can take your unrealized capital gains and you can invest them into one of the opportunity funds uh, long term. If you're willing to leave it in there for five years, you get a 10 percent decrement on the, the taxes that you would owe on that capital gains. Leaving in an extra two years, you get another 5 percent. But if you want to go the long term and leave it in for 10 years, you have to pay no capital gains on the increase uh, from the investment. So it's a capital gains tax break 
for outside private investors who may want to get a break. They made some money in the market or wherever. They've made a capital gain, put some of that money into these enterprise zones, and they get a capital gains tax break. Is, is that roughly what, what's, what's happening here? That, that's exactly right. It's a win-win situation. Yeah. You know, they, they get a tax break, and we finally get the kind of investment that we need in the areas that have been economically neglected. And then we couple that with some of the many other programs that we have, like the, the RAD program. Program, the rental assistance demonstration, which create public-private partnerships and, and really takes over the uh, public housing stock and converts it into something that is really nice. Uh, and those and the new market tax credits and all of these things together give us a possibility of doing something that has not been done before. Real inspiring plan there. So let me get this straight. These businesses that may or may not pay a living wage get a tax break and the community, communities they're in don't get to reap the benefits of tax revenue that will go to stuff like, I don't know, schools, infrastructure, public services. And notice how he seems to put emphasis on saying this has not been done before, but it has been. Democrats and Republicans have repackaged and resold various iterations of Nixon's black capitalism for decades. Whether it's called black capitalism, opportunity zones, or whatever else they'll call it in the future, it's built on a false premise. The idea that what is good for business is good for black people, when our entire history has proven this idea to be false. We also need to get rid of the fantasy that small businesses are somehow inherently progressive. Now, I certainly don't put small businesses in the same category as corporate giants like Amazon, and many small businesses are run by genuinely good people, but often they are structurally incapable of providing the things that improve working people's lives. Sometimes they really can't pay a living wage or provide good health benefits. And there's just no way that the majority of people of any race are going to become business owners. Most will be working for someone else. The solution is not to double down on creating more small businesses. It's to build a labor movement and a strong welfare state. The majority of black people have only made significant progress when there has been strong federal policies to redistribute wealth and power, expansions of the public sector and the growth of the trade union movement. Let's look at some of the numbers on this. When it comes to the public sector, 20% of black workers are employed in the public sector, which means they are disproportionately more likely to be in public employment. Around a third of these public sector jobs are unionized. So these are jobs that are more likely to offer stability, a living wage and strong benefits. On the whole, black workers in the public sector make almost 25% more in wages than their counterparts in the private sector. Public sector jobs have been and still are a critical lifeline for wealth stability among black communities. In fact, the public sector has been the single greatest mitigating, the single greatest factor mitigating black poverty, and that's an empirical fact. And speaking in broad terms, there have been three historical periods when black people have made substantial progress economically and in the realm of civil rights. The first being reconstruction, when protection was granted by the federal government to try to enforce basic civil rights. Important public social programs were established in the South, and even some federal employment was opened up to Black people. And if you're interested to hear more on Reconstruction, we have a great guest for you. But the second period was the era of the New Deal and World War II, where Black workers got a deeper foothold in expanded public employment, and over one million Black workers joined the mostly private sector trade union movement. And the third period was, of course, during the 1960s, with civil rights and voting rights enshrined into law which took vigorous action from the federal government. And again, black people took advantage of a huge expansion of public employment in the 60s to get relatively secure and well-paid jobs. Notice how during these periods, the establishment of businesses, whether black owned or not, did not play a significant role in actually advancing the interests of the majority of black people. We don't have to go to black capitalism for inspiration on how we address the crisis that so many black people are facing. There was another model put forward in the 60s, and that was the Freedom Budget, developed by civil rights strategist Barrett Rustin and union leader A. Philip Randall. The program of the Freedom Budget represented a complete redistribution of wealth and power in our society. It called for national health concerns, full employment, the elimination of slums with high quality uh, affordable housing, raising the minimum wage, and more. This program would have, of course, benefited all working people. But we should always be clear that black people are disproportionately working class people, more so than whites. This is the model that should inspire us today. Um, and let's listen a little bit to Baird Rustin talking about the freedom budget. The freedom budget furthermore says that until 
that when you talk about Negroes helping themselves, Negroes are prepared to help themselves. One fourth of all the Negro poor are not unemployed. They are working at beneath minimum wages in the cotton fields of Mississippi for three dollars a day, in houses as maids as eight dollars a week in Montgomery, Alabama, help themselves. Now we want a two dollar minimum wage so that Negro people who are working and deserve a decent wage shall have it. Now you'll say to me, but Mr. Rustin, my father owns a little store and he couldn't possibly pay two dollar minimum wage. If he owns a tiny little store, you're probably right. I want to help him too. Oh, I want to help everybody. <laughs> If we can subsidize Mr. Rockefeller's and Mr. Harrington's railways for billions of dollars, and if we can give farmers billions of dollars because they don't plant or because they plant here or because they burn this crop and save this one, then I am for a two dollar minimum wage in which those employers who cannot afford truly to pay it receive subsidies from the government in order to pay it. I am not for brutalizing the poor small businessman. I am for helping the worker who is exploited. And if to do that, we have to help the small businessman. Amen. So let me be clear here, because I know I might be sounding a little bit harsh. Would it be terrible to have more black owned uh, small businesses? No. If you want to go out and support black owned businesses, fine. But let's not pretend this is going to really improve the conditions most black people face only by expanding the public sector, expanding high quality public employment and reviving the trade union movement. Can we do that? Um, and then I, I really like how by Rustin, he brought up the thing about, you know, we can subsidize small business owners to pay a living wage. I mean, we can do this in a way that actually won't really hurt the majority of small business owners who, again, I want to be clear, I'm not putting them in the same category as Amazon, but having a, a million more small business owners is not really going to get at, at the problem here. And that's my point. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly agree with you. And I like that you, um, you juxtapose the rhetoric that we've heard from, uh, by the way, that find from the Nixon ad, like, incredible. Uh, but right. how that rhetoric is used to kind of push this notion of, of black capitalism, something that they're not even being genuine or sincere about, you juxtapose that with the um, public jobs. Uh, and you had a great discussion about um, the importance of the post office for the black community. Right. And everyone should check out that talk. I learned a lot um, listening to that. Um, and it's true. I mean, it's just demonstrably true. You, the main thesis that you just presented, um, it, you, you have historical, um, you know, context to, to provide evidence of that. Um, but I, I also wish that you heard more, uh, you know, the argument about subsidizing small businesses. Whenever we have these um, incredibly annoying debates about increasing the minimum wage today, you don't hear that argument being made, right. right? Like no one's proposing that anymore. And so like, I remember having this debate with a close friend of mine who was a small business owner and he was being real with me. He was just saying like, I can't afford to pay $15 an hour to my employees. Like we would shut down. And that forced me to like really look for different solutions. And that was the solution that made the most sense. Right. Um, but again, I agree overall, uh, you know, a federal jobs guarantee is so critical uh, to uplifting uh, people in this economy, you know? And I think that oftentimes when you hear conversations about a federal jobs guarantee, that component regarding race and how people of color would benefit from it is kind of left out. I don't know if it's done intentionally, um, but a federal jobs guarantee would do a lot uh, for this country. And I think it's important to have it tied to something like the Green New Deal or environmental policy where we can actually kill two birds with one stone, right? right? Develop renewable energy and at the same time provide well-paying jobs in the country. So I yeah. love I love your, your uh, decode. So good. Thanks. Well, I'm eager to get to uh, Professor Foner, though. We've kept him waiting. 
We did. We did. Uh, but thank you uh, for being generous with your time. Uh, joining us now is Professor Eric Foner. He is an author and also uh, an emeritus professor of history at Columbia. He's also a leading expert on reconstruction and is the author of uh, a book titled Reconstruction. Uh, professor Foner, thank you for joining us. Yeah, nice. Nice to be here to talk to you. And I'll just say, Professor Foner, you know, I'm a high school history teacher. We're about to teach uh, Reconstruction soon. So I'm looking for some lesson plan ideas, by the okay, way. Okay, great. Well, great. Um, you know, let's let's try to understand, uh, you know, what this country experienced in the Capitol with the riots on January 6th by, um, you know, looking at our historical context. And so, you know, many people saw what happened that day as something that was unprecedented. Um, but if you look back, especially at the Reconstruction era, that's not true at all. Uh, so can you um, talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, uh, I was watching those events on January 6th on TV, like many people were, and the commentators kept saying, you know, this is unprecedented, this is not who we are, this has never happened before. Uh, yeah, it's unprecedented when it comes to the Capitol itself, the building itself. We, we haven't had a mob uh, storm the Capitol before, but certainly in during and after Reconstruction, that is in the last third, let's say, of the 19th century, you had a good number of violent episodes by white supremacists trying to and sometimes succeeding in overturning democratically elected governments, biracial governments, because in Reconstruction, for the first time in American history, African-American men uh, enjoyed, uh, you know, significant political power. Uh, and this, of course, produced a, a pretty violent backlash among uh, most of the white South. Uh, so, yeah, you had events like the Colfax Massacre in Louisiana, 1873, when, uh, again, armed an armed mob of whites uh, surrounded the, the county, or they called it the parish in Louisiana, uh, courthouse, and eventually killed a whole bunch of black militiamen who were defending the local government. You had the White League in New Orleans in 1874, an uprising trying to overthrow the... Um, elected government of Louisiana. After Reconstruction, you can go to the Wilmington riot of 1898, where again, an elected biracial local government was just ousted by a kind of armed coup d'etat by a white mob. So in other words, we have seen this kind of thing before, uh, so, unfortunately. Yeah, and can, can we get into uh, Reconstruction itself? It's a really fascinating period of our history. And, and obviously, like you just mentioned, there was great repression. Um, so could you talk about what was re uh, Reconstruction broadly, but also what were some of the progressive gains that were made yeah. during Reconstruction? Well, Reconstruction, uh, that term is used for two, not, uh, two slightly different things. One is it's a time period of American history. It's the usually the, the 12 years after the Civil War, 1865 to 1877, sort of like the Progressive Era, the New Deal, it's a period of American history. But more significantly, I think, Reconstruction is a very complicated historical process. It's the process by which the country tried to come to terms with the abolition of slavery in this country. You know, there were 4 million slaves in the United States in 1860 on the eve of the Civil War. This was by far the largest slave system the modern world has ever known. And, uh, you know, the Civil War destroyed it. And, and that raised as many questions as it answered. And the number one question was, what's going to be the status of these four million emancipated slaves? Are they going to be citizens? Are they going to have the same rights as white people? What does it mean to be free anyway in America? Does it carry with it political rights, economic rights, social rights? That was the battle in Reconstruction. Reconstruction was a remarkable moment because uh, you had a, a remarkable coalition of uh, progressive-minded white people in the North and a, a very activist African-Americans in the South who sort of established the political agenda and uh, rewrote the laws and the Constitution, you know, three major amendments added to the Constitution, 13th, 14th, and 15th that established the right of citizenship of anybody born in the country and then introduced the idea of equality among citizens, 
in the 14th Amendment, equal protection of the law for everybody. In fact, beyond citizens, all persons entitled to e equal protection of the law. That included immigrants and people who, uh, aliens, one kind or another. Um, so Reconstruction was the first real experience of biracial democracy in American history. Uh, and these governments in the South, they, they had numerous problems. I mean, you know, you can list them all. There, were, there was the vast economic destruction that the Civil War had caused. There was this violent white supremacist uh, backlash where they, you know, large numbers of white people just refused to accept the idea of African-American people as uh, equal citizens of the country. Um, and, um, you know, they face a lot of challenges building from scratch a Republican Party, a biracial Republican Party in the South, uh, and dealing with the northern allies whose, whose interests often weren't quite the same as those of recently freed slaves. But, um, you know, it was, uh, it was a time which, uh, to, even though it failed in the sense that it didn't secure permanently the rights that were actually written into the laws and constitution. Um, it is an inspiring moment. And I think there are a lot of lessons in Reconstruction uh, for the current uh, situation, both in terms of the politics of Reconstruction and the economic change or lack thereof uh, in that time period. Yeah, you know, one thing that I, I found interesting was um, just the power of Congress at the time and, and how far uh, Congress was willing to go to ensure that Southern Democrats would um, accept uh, this new reality in America, right? And so yeah. um, can you talk about that a little bit? Because it's something, I mean, when you think about how incredibly weak and pathetic our Congress is today and you compare it to what Congress did, did then, it kind of really like blows your mind. Yeah, so, I mean, that's a, that's a very good point, you know. All three of those pivotal constitutional amendments, 13, 14, 15, end with a clause saying Congress shall have the power to enforce this amendment. In other words, they said, look, we are the ones who are going to decide, is equal protection of the law being uh, guaranteed in the South? Uh, and many other issues, the privileges and immunities of citizens, due process of law, other things which are actually not weren't very much thought of until right now. I mean, the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment says that uh, anybody who took an oath to support the Constitution and then supported or gave, you know, aid and comfort to insurrection uh, is going to be forever barred from holding office. Uh, many people today are thinking, uh, and I support this, this should be... Um, this should be imposed on ex-president Trump. I mean, this is the kind of thing that the Congress was trying to ward off the president or other officials actually sympathizing with, uh, you know, insurrection. Um, the Congress was in under the control of the Republican Party with a very large majority. The South was not yet represented in Congress when Reconstruction began. Um, and um, the president, uh, Andrew Johnson, who succeeded Lincoln after Lincoln's assassination, was a deeply racist uh, white Southern Southerner, white supremacist, probably the most racist president we've had, actually, although there's some competition for that title. Um, so um, you're absolutely right. Congress seized the initiative. Congress said, we're going to determine what is necessary to reunite the country, and we are going to enforce these constitutional amendments. And in the early 1870s, Congress passed what were called enforcement acts to bring federal power to bear in the South to try to crush the Klan and uh, white supremacist terrorist groups like that, and uh, to try to implement the rights that had been written into the Constitution, but weren't so easy to implement on the ground level. And uh, can you talk a little more about the conservative reaction to Reconstruction um, and especially, you know, the populist movement kind of showed some examples of poor white people uniting with poor black people. And, you know, if that was destroyed, then the whole hope of Reconstruction was. So how okay. did they get poor white people to, you know, join yeah. the reaction? What was the propaganda? And I mean, what can we learn from that today as we're dealing with the situation where Many people are supporting the far right who it's not really in their interest to do so. Yeah, well, 
You know, W.E.B. Du Bois in his great book, Black Reconstruction in America, which was written in the 1930s, and one of the early attempts to show the promise and the achievement of Reconstruction, because at that time, Reconstruction, most historians were just dismissing it as a period of misgovernment and corruption and everything, uh, which is not true at all. But, um, you know, Du Bois said that the real problem in Reconstruction was the failure of white workers to see a community of interest with poor black people in the South. In other words, white and black labor did not coalesce uh, in the way that Du Bois wanted it to have or felt it should have. And he used this phrase, which has become quite commonly used lately, the wages of whiteness, poorer white people. um, A way you might translate that today is white privilege, wages of whiteness factory workers in the north, poor white farmers in the south. Not all, but most of them, it seems, did not see that the interests of emancipated slaves were fundamentally the same as their uh, interests. The heritage of racism was very hard to overcome. You're talking about four, five, six, seven years after the end of slavery, you know? Uh, It's it's hard to uh, imagine that people would just throw off the whole heritage of racism and say, oh, well, okay, now we're going to accept black people as our equal citizens. In fact, a good number did. I mean, it might be in in a number of states like North Carolina or Arkansas, some of the poorer whites who were not part of the plantation system, who lived in the more uh, upcountry, you know, mountainous areas, weren't really plugged into the plantation regime. Uh, in those areas, you did have a lot of white people for a good amount of time who joined up in uh, coalitions with uh, recently freed slaves. And that happened off and on until the end of the 19th century. In the 1890s, the populist movement, that's when, that's when the word populism is really ought to be used. Not today, it's thrown about uh, very uh, unanalytically, let's say. But uh, the populist movement in the South in the 1890s did try to bring black and white farmers together, small farmers, tenant farmers, sharecroppers, people like that. Um, it had some success, but again, the, the power of white supremacy was uh, pretty strong. And you might almost say the legacy or the weight of the Civil War weighing on political alignments. You know, uh, Northerners were gonna vote Republican uh, for a long, long time, that was the party of the Union, of Lincoln, of, sla- of emancipation. White Southerners, most of them were tied to the Democratic Party, the party of the Confederacy, the party of uh, white supremacy. Um, so you can look at it and say, well, pr- some, f- some progress was made in building interracial coalitions. You had black, you know, the legislatures of Southern states had black people and white people working together in the same you know, body, the first time ever in American history you had anything like that. And it was only around 1900 when the right to vote, which had been granted to black men during Reconstruction, was finally taken away by the southern states as part of the imposition of the Jim Crow system. Uh, It was only when black voting was basically eliminating that the possibility of black-white political alliances in the South was kind of killed until, you know, 70 years later with the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Revolution, when again, the possibility of these political uh, alliances was uh, revived. Can we talk a little bit about the the way that Reconstruction is is taught in this country and, and, and how the story has kind of been I mean, rewritten. Um, I, I, do you agree with that? And if so, uh, to whose benefit? Well, you know, Re- Reconstruction is a good example of how po- historical interpretation is part of the present as well as the past. What I mean is it reflects the present and it influences the present. So after Reconstruction, let's say in the late 19th, very late and early 20th century, the the Dunning, what we call the Dunning School, named after my predecessor a long time ago at Columbia, William A. Dunning, who was teaching there. He and his students put forward the first scholarly books on Reconstruction, but they were completely biased against blacks. Uh, 
They felt that giving black men the right to vote was the biggest mistake in American history. Black people are just inferior. They're incapable of, um, you know, of taking part intelligently in a political democracy. And the result was corruption, misgovernment, that the Reconstruction governments were the lowest point in the history of the United States. And this was partly a justification of the Klan, you know? Well, yeah, maybe they went a little overboard, but they were really, you know, they had good reason to try to get rid of these governments and to put black people back in their proper place of subordination. And that view of reconstruction as really a, a big mistake lasted a long, long time. That's And in the North as well as the South. I mean, I was uh, I grew up in the in Long Island in the suburbs. That's what I learned in high school, you know, in my textbooks, mm -hmm. my teacher, uh, that Reconstruction was just a terrible error. It's not really taught that way anymore. Over the past generation or two, a whole bunch of historians, including me and a lot of others, have rewritten the history of Reconstruction and see it in a much more positive light, I see it as a kind of a precursor, you might say, to the civil rights revolution of the 1960s, which is sometimes called the Second Reconstruction. But the point I want to make is that the old view of Reconstruction was part of the intellectual le legitimation of the Jim Crow South. In other words, the rights of black people have been taken away by that point, but Reconstruction was the justification for that. If you gave black people the right to vote, if you gave them other civil rights, you'd have a replay of the so-called horrors of Reconstruction. Whenever anyone said, hey, look, you know, this is not a fair, a fair or equal system in the South, they say, all right, but look, we don't want to have another Reconstruction here, so we got to keep Black people in a subordinate uh, position. So a historical interpretation became part of the justification for a racist present. And it's a sad commentary, I have to say, as a historian, it's a commentary on the historical profession in this country and how it sacrificed, you know, historical scholarship, really, on the altar of racism. Du Bois made this point brilliantly in Black Reconstruction in his final chapter, where he, which is called the propaganda of history. And it was just taking apart the whole edifice of historical interpretation as it existed there in the 1930s. So the history of Reconstruction, how we think about Reconstruction matters. And, uh, but I think there's been a lot of progress in the way it's taught in the last, I, I look at American history textbooks, I think Reconstruction is presented in a much more positive light now than it used to be. And of course, um, D.W. Griffith's uh, Birth of a Nation is a great example of that rewriting of history. If anyone wants to be appalled and shocked, uh, go up and look up some clips of Birth of a Nation. Um, it, it had its premiere in the White House under Woodrow Wilson, and it's a glorification of the Ku Klux Klan. And um, again, it's the same point. A, a lot of it is about Reconstruction and the so-called just collapse of genuine democratic government, and it, it justifies the Klan. So yeah. In other words, this view of Reconstruction was not just a scholarly issue within the historical profession. It became part of the broad general culture, and Birth of a Nation was very important in pushing it out in that way. Yeah. You no, know, I can't help but think of um, a quote that Mike Pompeo got a little bit of heat for, um, where he said that the winners get to write the history books. Um, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, well, now the losers are writing them, at least the people right. who supported Reconstruction, uh, in a way. Um, yeah, well, I don't think we should take Pompeo as our guide for the <laughs> writing of history. But actually, speaking of Pompeo, a, a little uh, straw in the wind here took place on the very night of January 6th. After the mob left and they went back to counting up the electoral votes, Lindsey Graham, of all people, you know, when when there were these challenges to the legitimacy of the electoral votes, Lindsey Graham said, you know, uh, oh, oh, it was Ted Cruz that said, well, why don't we have an electoral commission to look into this, like they did at the end of Reconstruction, because Reconstruction was officially ended in a disputed election of 1876. And uh, Graham said, you know, I don't think that... Um, uh, that electoral commission then really worked out all that well, because they ended up ending Reconstruction. 
<laughs> and instead of Reconstruction, we got Jim Crow, which was terrible. So you had Lindsey Graham defending the history, the reputation of Reconstruction on the Senate floor in the middle of the night. Uh, and I said, well, well, times have changed, I guess. I, I, the, a guy like Lindsey Graham from South Carolina wouldn't have been defending yeah. Reconstruction not, not that long ago. Yeah. There's a great story about um, C.L.R. James, the great uh, black Marxist writer and activist. Um, he thought Birth of a Nation was such a great piece of cinema. He used to sneak in the theaters to watch it in the morning and then pick it in the afternoon. Um, it's, pretty, it's very dramatic. Uh, right. I mean, you know, well, it's like Malcolm X. Remember saying, uh, I used to go and sneak in and watch Tarzan movies. Uh, right. <laughs> but I, he, did, he said it took me a long time to realize that. I was not Tarzan. I was the guy Tarzan was trying to fight, you know? Uh, so yeah, Birth of a Nation is considered a landmark in cinema because of its technical uh, advances, but it's deeply racist and, you know, it had practical consequences. There were lynchings in the South mm -hmm. inspired by people watching the film Birth of a Nation, you know? Right. So it wasn't just a question of freedom of speech or something. There were very practical results of that kind of a racist ideology. Yeah. Um, so one one question that comes up on the left, I think increasingly more people on the left are talking about um, the federalist nature of our government and how that makes, um, you know, meaningful reform difficult. Can you talk about, I mean, what can we learn from Reconstruction about the federalist nature of our government and maybe how to overcome that? Right. Well, you know, <laughs> Reconstruction was a tremendous exercise of national power. As you, you said a little while ago, Congress kind of seized the levers of power and operated them for uh, a, a good number of years. Um, and they had to do that. I mean, slavery had been created by state law. It wasn't the federal government. The federal government protected it, but it was state law that really established slavery. Um, President Andrew Johnson get, created new governments in the South controlled by white people, and they started using their local power to try to push people black into a condition almost of slavery, so-called black code laws, uh, forcing people to go to work or be put in jail, that kind of thing. Um, so it needed federal intervention. It needed national intervention, absolutely. And those constitutional amendments and the first national civil rights laws that were passed in Reconstruction, uh, these things, uh, and then even, and vigorous action. I mean, in 1871, uh, President Grant sent the troops into South Carolina to crush the Ku Klux Klan, which he succeeded in doing for a while. Later on, that kind of violence recurred and Northerners had become less willing to intervene on behalf of former slaves in the South. So, um, but on the other hand, you know, <laughs> I personally, and I don't speak for anyone on this except myself, I think people on the left should not worry so much about federal power, state power. I think wherever you can, you push forward our principles. And there's nothing inherently good or bad about state power or national power. I mean, under Trump, he used the latent power of the presidency in all sorts of terrible ways. Uh, that's national power, but it was, was not used properly. You know, national power is very important when you get to a place like Reconstruction, but I'm, look, look what's happened. You know, what about when uh, the border patrol on the, Canadian, on the Mexican border is exemplifying national power? So, you know, it, to me, it's not a question of federalism versus state power, national power. It's what are the policies, what are they trying to accomplish and, um, you know, are they good or bad, basically? And I think that at any level, people can struggle and should struggle to get, you know, better policies in this country. You know, on the left right now, there's this uh, debate regarding um, how to respond to the Democratic Party. Uh, should the left be oppositional to the Democratic Party? Um, and, you know, if not, what are what are some of the limitations of supporting Democrats at every turn, um, especially under this system where you don't really have yeah. many options? You know, I think you can learn something from Reconstruction. Um, the in you know, you, as I said, the dynamic force was both African Americans themselves in the South claiming 
rights they had never enjoyed, but also the group in Congress called the Radical Republicans. Um, people like Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania, Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, the senator. One of the more ironic, perhaps, photographs from January 6th was a guy with his Confederate flag standing in front of a portrait in the Capitol of Charles Sumner, the great abolitionist uh, mem member of the Senate from Massachusetts. But the radicals knew how to be radicals within the political system. And they, how they, up, they were part of the Republican Party, but they also had their own distinct identity. They pushed for things, but they knew, in a sense, they knew how to use the political system to move forward. They put forward principled stands on everything, on black rights and other things, but they knew when to compromise. They knew you might have to take half a loaf instead of the whole thing at the moment. Um, they worked outside of Congress to promote, to generate public opinion in favor of their, uh, their policies. And uh, both in the Civil War and Reconstruction, they were you know, part of the cutting edge of politics. They weren't a majority. There was never a radical Republican majority in Congress. But in a crisis, people who have a clear program have a lot more power than just their numbers because your mainstream kind of middle of the roaders didn't know what to do about Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And they tried various things which didn't work out very well. And eventually they said, you know, these radicals, I'm not sure I like them all, but they've got a real plan. Maybe, maybe what they're trying to get accomplished here, black suffrage, you know, equal rights, all that, maybe that'll solve the problem of Reconstruction. So, um, you know, my view is you've got to be both in and out of the Democratic Party that's today or the Republican Party as it was back in the 1860s. Uh, don't just burn all your bridges. That wouldn't really, you don't want to isolate yourself uh, which is always a danger. Uh, and you don't want to just succumb to the rule of the majority of your party because you're always going to be a minority. But taking the role of the ideological vanguard in a crisis moment uh, can lead to very substantial accomplishments. And I think Reconstruction shows that. And, uh, you know, there was a heavily working class component to Reconstruction and the Republican Party. Um, you know, today there's a lot of talk about, it seems like many working class people are leaving the Democratic Party, either dropping out of politics or going to the Republicans. So I mean, what do you think of that? I mean, does it matter? And if it does, what, what do we do about what that? Do I, think? I think it's unfortunate if uh, working class people or any people join up with the Republican Party, that's uh, definitely not the way our country ought to be going. Um, you know, there's a million pundits out there analyzing election returns and all that. It certainly does seem that a shift has been taking place whereby the Democrat, at least the, the, the ways the Democrats win is by attracting a more upper class or not upper, but upper middle class electorate, um, uh, suburban people. Um, everyone is commenting on how in the last election, 2020, you know, a certain number of African-American voters and uh, Latino voters uh, moved actually toward Trump uh, and that the um, it was actually among white suburbanites that the shift from Trump to Biden took place. You know, I think that's very unfortunate. I think the Democratic Party at the moment is pushing forward policies that would be very ad uh, advantageous to large numbers of working class people. It's not socialism. It's not social democracy. Uh, all the flaws you can easily identify. And yet compared to what we have had, uh, I think it's, many of these policies are a step forward um, and I think need to be supported by radicals as steps toward greater progress uh, in the in the future. Um, but uh, you, you know, a, a, a part of the problem here is when people talk about working class voters, they tend to, they tend on, in an unspoken way to be talking about white people. 
you know, most black people, as you were mentioning in your previous segment about black capitalism, most African-Americans are working class people. Most Latino people are working class people. Uh, and yet they don't seem to count in the analysis. They are used, they're categorized by their race or their ethnicity, not their class position. So if you add them in, you'll find that there are still a heck of a lot of working class people who are supporting the Democratic Party. And um, one, ho you know, the, the Democrats have been over the past 20, 30 years are quite guilty of promoting policies, you know, financialization of the economy, globalization, which have been very disadvantageous to large numbers of Americans, including working class Americans. So, you know, people saying, well, I can't trust either of these parties. Uh, you know, they got a point, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the, the Democrats said, well, trust us, we're different now. It takes time for people to uh, accept that, I would assume. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do have one final question, um, if you mm -hmm. allow the time, because I know you of have course, to go. go ahead. Um, but what you just said um, sparked another question that I had uh, regarding, you know, it, it is interesting that the Democratic Party, I think, makes a very intentional effort to, um, you know, uh, refer to um, the African-American community based on their race and, and not identify, uh, you know, their class. And so I think they do that mainly so they don't have to focus on economic issues um, during their campaigning. And instead, they focus on, um, you know, topics of intersectionality, topics of race, gender, sexuality. Mm -hmm. And so how do we tackle that? Um, on the left. So we have more of a material understanding of what's going on and, and, and make arguments that actually matter, that would actually uplift yeah. universalist programs, that would uplift everyone, but especially, <laughs> you know, the working class in this country, which, uh, as yeah. you mentioned, primarily consists of um, Black people, people of color. Um, how do we address it without, I think, the inevitable backlash that's perpetuated by mass media, you know, the backlash. Yeah, yeah, you know, I've, <laughs> I'm laughing just because uh, this question has been debated, uh, I don't know, since the first uh, guys got off the Mayflower boat, you know. Um, how do you balance off race and class in a society in which both are bases of inequality of all kinds, but they're not exactly the same thing, even though they overlap? in significant ways. Um, I mean, the fact is that I, I think what Democrats have to do is to promote things that will benefit everybody. It's, this doesn't mean you ignore the specific racial configuration of so many forms of inequality in our society, but things that are being talked about right now, um, you know, COVID benefits to every family, up, you know, working class family, or raising the minimum wage, even though it might, as we heard, hurt some small business people. Um, you know, I, I am, I, I don't, I don't actually like to use the term identity politics, because I think it carries with a lot, it carries nowadays a lot of weight that I don't want to necessarily adopt. But I, I do think Democrats have been sort of amused into assuming that demography is kind of political destiny, you know, and uh, that, you know, you remember all this talk, oh, you know, in 2045, we're going to have a majority minority country, white people will no longer be a majority, and therefore the Democrats are just going to rule forever. Well, we discovered in the last election, a lot of people who are not white aren't necessarily Democrats either, and that some of what Trump says appeals to people who are working class, but are not, you know, who are non-white, but non the people of color. Um, and I think it's it's important to get away from the idea that be, by virtue of being a person in color, you, of color, you are automatically kind of assumed to be a Democrat forever. And I think once we get away from that idea and realize we have to appeal to people all across the board, um, Maybe uh, now that doesn't mean dropping a, a, a critique of racist policing or things like that, but it does mean 
not only talking about things that are specifically uh, affecting one group or another, but trying to talk about things that are good for everybody, or at least the large swath of the population. Professor well Eric Boner, thank you. Yeah, that that was. Thank you for answering that question. I appreciate it, and I appreciate you. Um, you know, being so generous with your time today. My um, pleasure. My pleasure. I'm, I'm happy to talk to you, and um, let keep up the fight. All right. Thanks, thank Professor. you so much. Okay. Bye bye. All right now, I have some lesson plan ideas. So I got what I needed out of that. Uh, but no, it really that was is great. A, yeah, it's a fascinating part of our history. And I mean, when I teach it, so many of my students are always shocked to find out like just how many black legislators were elected in powerful positions, you know, it, and we always think of progress as like linear, you know, like right. the year 1910, it must have been better than 1900 and it's reconstruction, all these gains made. And it's just incredible how they were rolled back as if that never happened. Right. That's, that's such a good point. Um, you know, it, that era was so tumultuous. And I, I think really understanding that helps people respond to this current moment accurately, right? Because I think that far too many Americans think that there's no way that um, progress can be reversed. Um, I know that, you know, based on what I was taught in high school in terms of social studies, I was under that assumption. Then you grow up and you learn more um, about, and the nuances of history that, you know, right. you're not typically taught in high school. And it, it makes you take certain things a lot more seriously. Um, and so uh, that was a great discussion. Uh, Kale, do you want to join in and um, maybe share some comments and super chats with us? Yeah. Um, well, first, thank you both for today's show. And thank you to Professor Foner for giving us his time today. Uh, he's great. He's, he's one of the greatest American historians and, and people should visit his work if they haven't already. Um, and people, if and you people out there watching us should hit like, you should hit subscribe, you should share this with your friends if you like this. And you should, you should, you know, talk about it with your friends, maybe your friend that you haven't talked to in a while that you, you need an excuse to, to open the conversation. Maybe you send us to them. So just, you just know, just some casual reconstruction <laughs> conversation. That's a good conversation. <laughs> um, I think the, uh, what you were saying about progress, it's interesting because one of the things that, because there is so much ideology built around, like, the virtues of capitalism, the virtues of, um, you know, uh, free enterprise, all these things that in their, like in that worldview, their sense of history is that it's just a linear account of progress, never ending, that it's like all these other histories just get swept up in, well, yeah, there was missteps, there was mistakes, but in the end, it was all worth it because look at where we ended up. Look at, you know, look at what, where capitalism took us. And I think in many ways, this post-2008, post-recession era, the last decade that we've been living through, has been a massive challenge to that. And it's been really kind of hard for some people who believe that ideology to kind of square the circle of, yeah, I guess maybe maybe this wasn't all this wasn't right. some some great final conclusion the end of history as uh some would say at the end of the, the yeah. fall of the soviet union that there are no more politics there's only just greater and greater capitalist prosperity for all uh and yet that's very clearly not the case so yeah and that this idea of like the long march it also takes out agency and the need to organize so like you could say well look i mean we wound up with the civil rights act didn't we it eventually happened i was like yeah after thousands of people risk risking their lives. And then, I mean, a titan titanic struggle over, you know, civil rights, um, you know, same like, oh yeah, we, you know, capitalism allowed unions eventually. Yeah, after many people dying from the National Guard, you know, so it's kind of just like, take out all the agency and the effort of the organizing and you just take it for granted that that was always gonna happen. Right, after capitalists yeah. and the ruling class over and over and over again fought right. against that kind of progress. Right. Sorry, Anna. Yeah. No. And, and you know, just to tie something back to uh, Paul's decode segment, I mean, that linear understanding of, of progress, which is obviously a flawed uh, perspective, um, creates uh, the perfect framing for people to buy into 
lies like the opportunity zones that were pushed by the Trump administration. And it, it was nothing more than a lie. I mean, it was sold to the American people as an um, as an opportunity to uh, create uh, businesses and development in um, you know, housing development, for instance, in um, uh, predominantly black parts of the country, black neighborhoods. But really what it ended up being, and I mean, anyone who has, I think, paid any attention to uh, our politicians, especially politicians like, you know, Trump. It's just a, a lie to create tax shelters for people who are tremendously wealthy. And what ended up happening with these opportunity zones is that uh, the developers uh, wanted tax shelters. So they ended up building these massive developments in areas that were not in any way uh, need of invest in need of investment or uh, they overwhelmingly gentrified parts of the country that pushed uh, the black community out. So um, again, I mean, people are willing to buy into those types of policy proposals if they think, if they're under the assumption that like, no, we're, we're moving in the, we've been moving in the right direction. There've been no hiccups, everything's great. You know, we're not going backwards in any way. Um, but you know, as we know, the truth is that's, that couldn't be further from the truth. Well, and there also is like, we can so we can i think in fact say largely thanks to things like the civil rights movement and that that era that there has been a great deal of moral progress in the country that i think you know and we see that insofar as like whether it's the opportunity zones or um you know over the summer the the amount of corporations that came out in favor of black lives matter that most people do in fact want anti-racist outcomes that like we should actually be pretty like ecstatic about that. The problem then of course becomes is that because not everyone has the time to, you know, to learn uh, every little, like some of the, the actual details about a certain plan or, um, you know, things are just very far away from their actual situation. Uh, or, you know, a lot of people, you know, many middle-class people uh, also abide by certain kinds of meritocratic logic of like well those deserving should come up in the world then you know we mm -hmm. should we should everyone should start from the same starting block uh and then we can have competition whereas uh socialists and people on the left would say no i mean maybe certain things in our life shouldn't be competition maybe we shouldn't be competing over like the basic necessities of life and right. yeah. while we agree that we should like guarantee everyone a, a starting block, it shouldn't just be the starting block. It should be like, again, the entire foundation of having a good life. Uh, and again, it's, you know, but it, it's this pushback against like a genuine kind of anti-racism that the left would propose, which necessarily means guaranteeing human rights, certain social rights at to a society, universal rights saying that, People, doesn't matter what your skin color is, you have certain innate worth uh, versus a kind of corporate kind of capital uh, A, capital R anti-racism, which is, uh, you know, we're going to put slogans up, we're going to put hashtags up, all the while we're going to try to destroy our uh, our working class, which again, as, as Foner and others have, have said, the American working class is the most diverse class in America. Um, trying to, de to uh, destroy their efforts to get the basic uh, things that, that go into a good life, that try to destroy unions, that try to repeal minimum wage laws, that uh, destroy the welfare state. So, you know, I think it's, it's all the more important to remember things like Reconstruction and remember, like Paul was saying, like the agency that's involved in these things, that it's, it's one thing to be anti-racist and that's another thing <clears throat> to actually have the social forces and the social institutions and working class people fighting for their interests against the interest, the interests of the ruling class, which does not ever actually want social progress. They don't want more democracy. They don't want you to have greater wealth because they need all the wealth they can get because they're in competition with each other. So, yeah. and I think what's appealing about kind of black capitalist angle, you know, it's, it's a lot less work to, uh, you know, buy from a black owned business, then like get involved in the movement and go to meetings and all that stuff, you know, or even, well, the route is just as an individual become a business owner. That's a lot easier to imagine than a mass movement, you know? So I think yeah. people like, okay, I shopped at my black owned business. I feel good. 
that somehow is just going to trickle down. Many black people will get that. Cool. So it's it's more Shopping appealing. Feels good. Shopping. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's true though. But like that, it, it, I think that brings up a real problem, right? In that. It's not, I don't think people are looking for easy solutions. I, I think that there's also this element of capitalism creating this symptom of just not being able to organize because you're overworked, right? Like you're overworked, you're, you have to work. I mean, an eight hour work day, I don't, I don't think most people um, uh, literally just work eight hours a day. You have people piecing together multiple part-time jobs in some cases. Yeah. Uh, you have people who might have a full-time job, but they don't work eight hours a day. They work like 16 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and it's just to survive, right? So if you're doing that, your number one priority is just to survive. You have no time left uh, to do the work, right? And I'm not making excuses for anyone. I'm just saying that um, it's just part of that. It's part of the system to make it increasingly difficult for people who want to organize to be able to do so, yeah. to have that resource of time and energy to do so. Mm -hmm. And I think, sorry, I'm delaying the super chat, but one more thing. I think the a real sign of hegemony is not just they're creating the problems, but they're also able to frame the solutions for people. So like this privatization mm -hmm. of everything is creating a problem, but they're so far in hegemony that people now frame the solution as more businesses or a business oriented solution. Um, so that that to me just shows like how much true hegemony they have over how we how we think about these problems. Mm hmm. No, I think that's right. Um, so people send in your super chat questions. We'll answer them live right now. Um, just a couple bucks and uh, we'll, we'll get you on Jacobin. Um, but we do have a question that I want to start with. Um, and this is a good one, uh, especially since we have Paul today, because Paul is a high school teacher. Um, uh, someone in a super chat is asking, do you think capitalism uh, ergo, big corporations acquiring small publishers risks uh, reversing trends towards more accurate education. Can open source democratic or open source democratizing? Sorry, it's worded a little strange. Sorry, can can open source uh, democratic education uh, combat indoctrination? Um, so again, basically, like the what we were talking about with with uh, Professor Foner a moment ago of how history is actually written that it's we sometimes forget the like intellectual processes and, and, um, mm -hmm. and production processes are a, it, sorry I'm <laughs> intellectual work is a production process in the same way that like there are different actors coming in into that uh, situation and creating different narratives about what happened in the past about how we understand the world um, how, so how has capitalism and kind of its institutions maybe rolled back that and, and yeah. how do we democratize education? Yeah, I think um, I'm going to be very on brand by answering this way. But th uh, this to me actually highlights the how important like institutions like teachers unions are actually in keeping that academic integrity and why privatization in general hurts that because I mean, one of the things we fight over in our teachers union a lot is actually control over our curriculum. And even the idea of like, you know, when we get professional developments, we want, you know, actual teachers and union members that are doing the job to give the professional development and create our own network of resource sharing. And I'll tell you, I mean, most probably 90% of social studies teachers in the district, like they actually wind up not using the textbook from the district. Um, you know, they bring in their own materials and the freedom to do that. And there's many schools, you know, like many charter schools, for example, where they're non-union, they don't have that freedom. And you literally have to mm -hmm. teach from a script. I've actually know people where this is true at their charter school, not necessarily all charter schools, but, you know, they got to teach from the script. So they don't have autonomy as workers. And um, that is one thing teachers unions fight for. I know it, it's not as high profile as like fighting for our wages and benefits. Um, so I would say, yeah, like I think saving public education and these institutions that protect public education workers is a big part of like academic integrity. Yeah, I mean, the intellectual freedom um, that comes with union protection is just so critical. And, and it's usually talked about when it comes to, um, you know, college level education. Um, but it's important, especially with social studies, uh, with grade school as well. Um, Paul, I was wondering if you could um, 
if you know anything about, or if you want to chime in on um, how history books are published in the country, I remember several years ago, there was a story about the Texas school board um, essentially trying to rewrite the history books um, and how it wouldn't just impact um, history lessons in Texas uh, because of the way those books are published and then dispersed across the country. It would actually impact school districts across the country. Um, do you have any experience with that? Yeah, you know, I probably should know more about it than I do. Um, you know, and again, I think it comes down to like, you know, if districts are looking to get the best deal on their textbooks, either because they're underfunded or, you know, that's just what they want or companies are looking to make a profit. Yeah, that's going to kind of um, poison the water of like the textbooks we're getting. It does very, it seems to vary a lot district to district. And also, again, like the amount of autonomy people has varies. Um, you know, like my, for example, in the Philadelphia district, like the textbooks are like, okay, I wouldn't call them. You're not going to see like describing reconstruction as a mistake. You know, you're not going to see that stuff. Um, but again, I think most teachers just come to the job knowing that, you know, we're not just going to teach you the textbook. We're going to bring in our own resources. Um, so I don't know. I probably didn't really answer the question, but I mean, it is a problem. And I think, again, going back to um, the effort to privatize education. And it's also why some of these school board races, you know, they seem kind of boring, but they can be very important. Um, and you have these charter school uh, groups, these lobbying groups that are also connected to textbook companies lobbying hard for school board races so they can have people on there kind of making decisions that uh, might help them, you know. And that's a, kind of another encouraging sign of like this um, upsurge of teacher union struggle is like they're actually getting more involved in school board races and running their own, you know, like former teachers uh, to be on the school board. But as you look closer, you find like, wow, they spend a lot of money, meaning our opposition just on a school board race, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's another question about education, actually, that we should just throw into the mix. Um, that super chat uh, questions asking, how can we teach the youth that all progress in the US uh, had mass labor movement, had the la a mass labor movement behind it. Do you think that information is withheld purposefully? I, um, I, would, I would just qualify just a, a little bit because I know I, I'm usually really uh, strong about this and say, well, listen, literally all progress was like made through the efforts of working people struggling for their interests. I think that's most of history. I, I want to just add the qualification. I don't think it's literally every single thing, but I, I think more times than not, you need people who have an interest in better progressive outcomes to be fighting for that uh, rather than, you know, it's not like it, if, if you're, you know, if you represent uh, some big business owner um, or, uh, you know, you are a big business owner, like you know, you actually, not only do you not have an interest in advancing uh, your workers democratic right to to vote or to have certain social rights uh, to be treated the same way under the law um, and not only do you not have an interest in them uh, not like having their wages raised uh, your interests are directly opposed to them so it, it, I think so I just I'm <laughs> this is an extended qualification I think the questioner is m mostly correct uh, but uh, we wouldn't want to say literally every single thing came about yeah. through the labor movement. And I think, I mean, in terms of the question of is the labor movement being taught in schools and why isn't it? I mean, I think there might be two things going on. I think first is like, I mean, just think about it. Class has been taken out of our society so much that even the type of even liberals that are writing textbooks, like it's probably just not on the radar. So, yeah, of course, you're going to get like the basics about the labor movement, but um, I think it's, again, it's up to the individual teacher and even for teachers, I think, again, we, we live more and more in a world where people are removed from that. Even if they're in a union, the union probably hasn't been on strike in a very long time. They probably don't know someone in their personal life that's been in, um, a union. So, I, I mean, I honestly think the best solution to that question is just building labor's power in society overall. And I think that will filter into schools. And I said this on the, the Jackman show Wednesday, like, what was so important about the teacher strikes like in West Virginia, not just that, of course, they won and that's great. But like now all those teachers have that experience and some of them were starting to connect it back to their roots in West Virginia with like the miners. And I, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't have like data on this, but I wouldn't be surprised if those now 
those teachers are now going into school and emphasizing labor more because it's a part of their life uh, more. And I think the more that happens, the more you'll see it reflected in schools. Yeah, I mean, Jane McAlevey talks about that a lot, um, the importance of winning and and yeah. celebrating those wins um, because it, it really helps to fuel uh, other, you know, efforts to organize and, and you know, it makes people spring into action. So mm -hmm. I love that. You're right. So speaking of Jane, actually, another questioner, uh, they, they both write that they really enjoyed us having Jane McAlevey on a couple of weeks ago. Thank you. Um, we love Jane. And uh, but their question is, uh, any update on the PRO Act? Um, what's going on with the PRO Act right now? I know. So the House had passed it. Um, unions are, I mean, they're pretty fired up around this um, lobbying for the Senate. Um, I honestly, you know, I wouldn't take it for granted that it would get passed. I mean, never underestimate Democrats' ability to find some excuse or one or two members that will vote against it. Um, I mean, I'm cautiously optimistic about it. I think people should definitely try look in your local areas and if unions are lobbying around it, um, you know, and targeting certain senators to get involved with that. Um, but I think we'll, we should be hearing news soon. Um, that's, that's all, that's all I can say about it. One of the things, um, this is something, uh, that Leo Panich, uh, the great, uh, left intellectual who passed away late last year uh, would stress a lot. And I think it's it's um, kind of, uh, it's highlighted both in Anna's segment today and Nando's segment last week. Uh, Nando did a segment on uh, why and how to repeal the filibuster that in many ways um, there's there's often time, like it, I'm thinking of a specific example, but he'll counter, like we'll kind of contrast there are those people on the left who uh, are typically understood as the more radical parts of the left that um, are all about the the long term ambitions of like this is what society will look like and it should be these particular radical reforms these particular policies uh, and it's it's almost entirely just on why it's good and this is what a good society would be and then you get more moderate elements that counter that uh, by saying well but that's not really feasible at the moment. So in fact, we really can't go for those policies or those politics or that platform. And instead we should moderate uh, and have, uh, you know, maybe more reformist kind of uh, items, things that are more incrementalist, um, not as ambitious, uh, because that's really more uh, uh, possible at the moment. And what Panich says, and again, I think this is emblematic of what Anna and Nando have been talking about, is that, you know, we on the left, like to be a, a, a serious democratic socialist in some sense, you have to be able to understand what those limitations are now and have active plans at changing those structures, changing those institutions, because we do want to hold the, the, the loftier, the, the actual platforms and policies that uh, will like resemble a better world. We do want to like hold that and, and push that forward. And we need to have real strategies about changing the institutions in the here and now that enable that process in the future. And so I think whether it's um, uh, what ended up happening with AOC and others uh, in the um, leadership election recently where they repealed, um, what is it, the... Uh, the, the, the pago carve outs yeah exactly mm -hmm. like yeah. the spending caps that limit our ability to actually expand public goods in society or for instance just recently in the senate uh sorry uh bernie sanders just passed um well with the rest of the senate as well but it's bernie um that uh basically kind of paving the way for a massive spending bill that's going to be coming down the line um so the reconciliation, yeah. And Pro Act, just so people don't know, pr Protect the Right to Organize Act. Um, long story short, it would make it a lot easier to organize unorganized workers in this country. It's extremely hard um, to organize a union currently. So, you know, it's one of those things like a law in itself is just a piece of paper, but, you know, it could open the, the door to unions be able to really take advantage of the situation. So people should really think about it. I mean, if anything, this law is more relevant to people that are not in a union. I mean, if you're in a union, you already are. Um, but the goal is to make it easier to get uh, more people in a union, except Donald Trump. I don't think he's gonna be getting back in the Screen Actors Guild, but 
for everyone else. <laughs> We've come full circle. Yeah, yeah. Right. Got to wrap it up that way. <laughs> who cares? Yeah. Who cares? Yeah, who but, cares? <laughs> but yeah, so I think, anyways, long way to say, I think that's part of a like part of why the PRO Act is significant. And I actually do think there's a decent chance that it could happen. I mean, again, I don't want to yeah. hold my and breath. And Biden has <laughs> been surprisingly good so far in labor stuff. I mean, firing the NLRB um, general counsel, but also recently um, federal service impasse panel. Trump was, this didn't get a lot of play, but really terrible towards federal workers. I mean, just all kinds of mm -hmm. like unprecedented union busting and um, Biden fired all 10 people who were appointed to that panel. Um, again, I'm not holding my hopes up for him being a great labor person, but my expectations were so low that he's surpassing them a little bit so far. So that's why it's same, always good, same. kids. Keep low expectation, kids. I'm fine. Yeah, no, no. I, I mean, it's, it's also what George Bush said. He's like, I like to keep uh, expectations low. <laughs> um, he he uh, definitely lowered our expectations. But yeah, yeah. I mean... It's funny because like I'm always I always feel a little anxiety when I get good feelings about Biden, right? Like I'm just like right. uh, this is not good. I'm going to be disappointed any minute now or there's some sort of catch. But um you know, even with uh his relief bill, I, I would like to see something far more robust including like repetitive uh direct payments to americans that isn't means tested um but at the same time i mean uh, his language regarding deficit spending is so different from what we got during the obama administration right. and i think it's it's worth it to point that out i think also uh positive reinforcement could go a long way um you know if there's something we see and we like i, I think it's good to provide positive reinforcement so we see more of it. Um, but that's not to say we shouldn't keep pushing the Biden administration as much as we can. And I mean, I don't even know how much influence, um, you know, left media has, but there seems to be some progressive influence within that administration. And that's definitely an improvement from what we've seen in the past. Mm -hmm. Right. So for a final question, I, it's actually, um, Someone submitted two different questions. I'm just going to put them together so that uh, we get to both of them. Because um, the so the, the first one I'll, I'll read is uh, they write young people are more informed and opinionated than I ever was as a student. Great if I agree with them. Has the web pushed forming opinions prematurely? Um, interesting question. Um, and then the the second question they they say uh, love the content and guess what are the best actions we can take to grow Jacobin. I donate what I can and share segments. Any advice from TYT Growth? Um, which, got I got to read that one. Thanks, guys. Um, but uh, so maybe the first one on um, just kind of picking up right where you left off, Anna, of the kind of what what's going on with this latest generation and social media and and how it's formed people's political opinions, uh, and in what ways, I guess. I mean, obviously, I'm. This is just my opinion, and it's based on speculation. So take it for what it's worth. Um, I definitely have noticed young people being far more informed on on everything, uh, and it's because they have that information at their fingertips. Uh, but I do think that there's an issue with how online discourse discourages people from exploring whether their preconceived notions are right or wrong. Right? Like there seems to be a resistance to that. And so um, it's okay to not know everything. And it's okay to acknowledge that, hey, I got some new evidence on an on a issue and I've now changed my mind based on this new evidence, based on what I've learned. Um, I think that that kind of thought process can be encouraged by, um, by our media, indie media. Um, and, and so I try to be better about um, just coming back on air if I got something wrong, for instance, and just say, I got this wrong and I want to make sure you guys have the right information. I used to think this, but it turns out that, you know, um, you look at historical data and you really scope out the situation today. And, you know, I'm, I'm giving you vague answers, but you get what I'm saying. I think that, you know, yes, I do notice that people tend to be a little more hardened in what they believe, um, but we should be open um, to new information and we should also be open about how we've changed our minds and, and, and really make a point about how that's okay. And I'll also say, I mean, just 
with the students I teach, and I, I hate to say this, I don't want to sound like a lame liberal that's like, oh no, social media is going to ruin the world. But, you know, I do notice that there is like more prevalence of conspiracy theory and just like a disorganized way of getting information. And like any event, it's like, you know, when back, this just pops in my head, but like when Trump, um, you know, did a drone strike and killed the general in Iran. And it was just like talking to my students. It was just like, I was hearing 10 different speculations that they heard on Instagram, you know? So, you know, I'm just saying like, like Anna was saying, you know, we shouldn't be freaking out about social media, but you know, it doesn't mean that people are always going to be more informed because of it. Um, and I do see it playing yeah. a damage because it's, and I always tell my students, like, it's very good to be skeptical of the government and the media you should be but you should also be just as skeptical as any random website you come across um so i don't know if that doesn't really answer the question but i do sometimes see people really going down conspiracy theory rabbit holes that are made just so easy by by social media yeah i i basically agree with uh what paul and anna had have said and i'm not really gonna add much more to it i would just the thing that i would say is that um I think some people might draw the conclusion by seeing the the demographics that support Bernie Sanders, for instance, and say, it's all because of the internet. It's because of an internet generation that had access to this information. I think that's true to an extent, of course. And again, in the ways that they're saying that there is so much more information available. And so people can, in fact, look up uh, information that is maybe not presented to them in other media outlets, uh, more mainstream outlets, TV outlets, like we were talking about earlier. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I, it's, I think the, the driving cause of all of this right now is largely more to do with these culmination of multiple, uh, whether it's crises or just massive disruptions uh, in people's lives between, um, you know, re more and more recessions, joblessness, uh, the um, minimum wage being frozen the uh all the wars that people have been involved in that have either have served or have family members that have served um that it's massive disruptions that really get away uh that take people away from the fundamentals of like what they want to do to actually live a good life that they don't have the means to do it or they're stuck in these these really awful situations and i think well you know there's something to be hopeful about is that there has been uh, you know, a large, at least a generation more, honestly, I mean, the thing is, like, when exit polls came out for Bernie in 2020, it was, he was getting, like, 80% of people under 45, like, and that's not a generational mm -hmm. thing, that's, that's, <laughs> like, those are people who have children, those are, like, that's a massive chunk of the population, um, but I think it is encouraging that people that have lived through so much in the last few decades of seeing not just not that they've lived through bad stuff, but that they've actively seen living standards declining and that conditions getting worse and that a good chunk of people are, in fact, proactively saying, yeah, I actually need to fight against this and that there is other strategies to deal with this than just let me just hold my head down and kind of get through right. my work week, get through my life. Uh, that people are saying, no, it actually will take collective action. It will take uh, building relationships with with other people who are like-minded, who want to, to fight for a better world. Um, and I think, again, our challenge as people who are more active socialists um, and organizers and thinkers and propagandists, I'm using that term very, like, in a, in a positive way, because we, we are propagating a, a, a political position for the benefit of working class people. But... Uh, you know, we, uh, I think our challenge still is getting more and more people to, uh, to uh, actually engage in politics and to become active that, you mm -hmm. know, our job is to is to be multipliers, in a certain sense. Um, and so the way that you can grow Jacobin, <laughs> the other part of the question, yeah, I mean, the magazine is fantastic. It's, I have it in the other room, I just got it, the, the Biden cover that, uh, <laughs> that, you know, we, we really show some love to our incoming president on. Um, we did I just got I just got it yesterday. <laughs> I can't wait to read it. Yeah, no, it's I mean, the magazine is, is fantastic. But I mean, I would just say, you know, uh, for what we're doing now, I mean, if you like the video again, please hit like, please hit subscribe, please share this with a friend, um, someone that either 
is already like-minded that isn't subscribed, or even better, who isn't, who you say, here's something that I found interesting or encouraging, and I want to show it to you and maybe even talk to you about it, about like the ideas that, uh, you know, left ideas, left political ideas. Um, because the thing is, there is no better time to do it than right now. Just because Biden's in office doesn't mean that, uh, you know, all of the momentum and the energy of the Bernie Sanders campaign uh, has to go away uh, to an extent. Obviously, the campaign's not going on anymore, but our political project continues and it needs more people to be active and it needs more people to be questioning the, the systems that govern their lives and say, no, it doesn't have to be like this. In fact, we can have a society that works for our needs, that works for our interests, uh, and it's going to take that kind of uh, collective effort. <laughs> yeah, you know, the only the only thing I'll add to that is, um, you know, people forget like TYT has been around forever. I've been working there for 14 years. So um, and the reason why its growth um, is stable is because, you know, it's a show that had a, a sincere ideology um, a sincere mis mission, and uh, we never shied away from that and didn't resort to um, the gimmicky stuff that I think uh, the media sometimes falls prey to. And so I see that similar stable growth with this show and with this, you know, with Jacobin in general. Um, and so it, it takes a little while, but it's it's based on something real. The growth is based on something real. Um, and that's far more important than like rapid growth um, that's based on like yeah. gimmicks and nonsense. And I think, you know, we look at how the right wing has advanced over the last few decades, a critical part of that infrastructure was media infrastructure and talk radio, you know, and I think, I think Harvey K said this few months ago, but, you know, I think that the next level for us now is get to the place where, you know, more average people who were not self-identified socialists are listening to us. You know, we're not, we're not there yet, but, um, you know, I think we are starting something, part of that media infrastructure that is very important for what we're doing. We shouldn't overstate the importance of the media, but, um, you know, I think the right wing has understood this, that you need media outlets. I mean, it's all propaganda, whatever side you're on, it's all propaganda. You need that getting out there to, and that will help build your force in, in society. Yeah. Um, I, I said that was the last super chat. This is, it's not a question, but I want to throw it up there. Uh, Erica says, still love oh, you. Erica. <laughs> <laughs> Take my stop money. Love you too, Erica. Thank you for watching. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Erica. We appreciate it. Um, so uh, that's it. Thanks guys. Yeah. Um, I'm going to bounce out and let them close it, but thank you again. Happy weekend. I don't know if that's a phrase people use, but it is now. And uh, hit like, subscribe, and share. <laughs> All right. Well, All right. Um, Paul, it was fantastic doing the show with you. Um, we got to have you on um, just as a guest, uh, just have oh, yeah. a discussion Anytime. about history. Yeah, it'd be great. Um, yeah, it'd be fantastic. <laughs> Everyone check out um, the call, uh, the call, sorry, the talk uh, that Paul had. I forget who your co-hosts were at the moment because you've done a few of them recently. About the post office. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Was, uh, Jen? Was Amber on that one, I think? Yeah, well, Amber Amber Frost is the guest and yeah. Jen was the uh, co-host. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So check it out. It was such a good conversation about the the post office and the importance of, um, you know, public jobs. Um, but anyway, uh, thank you to everyone for watching. And um, please, as, as Kale said, and I'll repeat it uh, myself, share uh, this stream, like this stream, and um, it's the best way to um, help support what we're doing here at Jacobin. And if you're not subscribed to the magazine, definitely subscribe. It's fantastic content, um, and we appreciate your support. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next week. Bye, everyone.